Welcome into another edition of the Flying Pigskin Podcast, where we talk everything Cincinnati Bengals. I'm joined again by the same cast here, Tanya O'Rourke and Reggie Wilson, here to break down week two for the Bengals. Unfortunately, another loss, a five-point loss to the Browns. They did cover the spread, guys. They did cover the six-point spread, but unfortunately, the Bengals now 0-2. Now, I was at the TV station last night, as was Tanya O'Rourke. Look, when you're at the TV station along with Tanya during a, a game, you don't even have to watch it. You can just close your eyes and listen to Tanya's reaction, and you know what happened. You Tanya. know how it's going, because I'm like, why? What are you doing? Oh, my God! Keep around! Yeah. That's and sometimes I didn't know if it was good or bad, though. That was the only thing. It's like, it I was hysterics. I life. hear Tanya yelling, and I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's now, hard to know. It's hard it's to know. Try being my child. Audio. What'd you say? Try being my child. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's just a podcast here, audio only, so all of you can, out there can't see that Reggie Wilson is wearing glasses for maybe the first time ever. First time I've ever seen him in glasses. Looking smooth, Reggie. So Thank I'm going to really trust his opinion on the game last night <laughs> since he got such a better, more clear look at it. Reggie, your thoughts? <laughs> so it was weird because I know initially I picked the, the Bengals to win, but then like during the – like the lead up to the game, I just got this weird feeling like, oh man, this might be like one of those nights. And it turned out to be one of those nights. So I think the Bengals looked as good as they could have looked considering what they have going on, which is no kind of offensive line and Jesus, no kind of defense yesterday. But um, Joe Burrow looked like he's a player. So that's good. He looked tough. And in, in, in his post-game press conference last night, he was asked multiple times about being hit. And somebody asked Joe Burrow, can you sustain these hits all season long? And he, I mean, it was a super quick answer. It was like a three-second answer. He said, yep, I'm good. But is he really, though, Tanya? Well, I mean, how long can he be good, you know? Um, let me he's just tough. say that. I, I think just we think- all learned that he's a tough kid. Oh, he is tough as nails. And I got to, he is so fun for me to watch. Sure. He made some mistakes yesterday that I was kind of surprised by, even though maybe I shouldn't be. He's still a rookie. He never had a preseason. This is still his second game ever playing in the NFL, but he, he, but he shows so much brilliance that you're like, this is this, he is the future, but how long can someone get slammed down. I mean, at one point, you know, someone got him around the neck and threw him down. And I thought, okay, really? I mean, how long do you get pushed around like that and tossed around and manhandled before you're like flinching? I don't know. Cause, and if you, I think the question, you know, been having been around for far longer than you two um, and watching this team, I'm just significantly older than both of you is that, you know, go ask Carson Palmer, how that felt after a while, go ask, you know, Andy Dalton, the last couple of seasons when you it's all about the line right when you don't have a strong line offensive line you this your poor quarterback is going to end up on the ground a lot and you cannot win a football game and I don't know when the Bengals will get a clue about this and actually shore up that line when they're going to reach into their very very deep and vast pockets and finally help this guy out but why would you let this poor dude suffer like this? And can they even do anything for the rest of the season? Can you, is there any way to even fix this until next season? I don't even know. I put so my heart breaks to see him like that. He's tough, but for how long? You talked about him getting wrapped up around the neck and that was Reggie. It's a play that you and I were actually texting about last night. It was on that read option close to the goal line, really kind of a disappointing sequence of events for the Bengals uh, because they had, I mean, it seemed like it took, two hours to just complete that sequence. You had the pass interference. You had a bunch of different things happen there. Uh, but just that, 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 you know, that call was a little bit interesting to go read option at that point in the game when, you know, Giovanni Bernard had just scored a touchdown, but it got called back. I mean, why don't you just feed it to him again and, you know, yeah. pound it up the middle until, you know, I don't know. But you, Tanya, you talked about Joe Burrow, showing signs of brilliance last night. I will say he had plenty of opportunities to do it because he threw the ball 61 times last night. That, that's is that sustainable? Than, that's go ahead, more, sorry. I'm going to go with no. 
That's more than any quarterback in the NFL threw it in week one. Interestingly, Baker Mayfield in two weeks has thrown 62 passes. That's only one more than Joe Burrow threw last night. Now, think about it. He's dropping back 61 times. That's a lot of opportunities for him to get hit, too, Reggie. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, it was interesting. Uh, I just went back and looked last year. That opener, you know, Andy threw it a bunch of times. He uh, had 51 dropbacks in that game against Seattle week one last year, and they lost by a point. And I think there's a trend here. When you have to drop back that many times, usually it's because you're playing from behind or things are not going the way that you want them to go. And I tweeted this last night, but he can never do that. Like, I never want to see him have 61 attempts again. Like, that's just not, as Tanya said, it's not sustainable and it's not good for his, you know, for the long term of his career because that means that, one, he might be playing from behind a lot, and two, with the line being what it is, it does, like you said, make him more susceptible to these hits. And he's a tough guy, but after a certain, you know, while, you see what happened to Andrew Luck. He's a tough guy, too, and now he's out of football. One of the best quarterback talents to ever come out, and he's out of football now in his early 30s, and he's yeah. done. That is tough. That is the reality that, that you know, could, you know, be facing Joe if they don't get him some help. That's just not good. I've heard a lot of comparisons over the last less than 24 hours between Joe Burrow and Andrew Luck. And and on one hand, that's a great comparison because Andrew Luck is maybe the smartest quarterback to ever come out of college. Uh, when you're talking about a, a dude that just has a great football IQ, on the other hand, it's a horrible comparison. You don't want that comparison because Andrew Luck – while he was one of the top quarterback prospects to ever come out of the college game, he's also out of the NFL game. He's out of the pro game now, and it's because of injuries. It's because he didn't have enough around him in Indianapolis. And I'm now, just, I've often thought, like, you know, not that it's a failure of a career, but Andrew Luck, for the promise that he had, never lived up to that. And it was because he never had a team. And I don't want to see that happen to Joe Burrow. I mean, you know, I'm a Bengals fan through and through, but this is a good kid. He deserves better than that. He just does. Now, I'll tell you, I I was at, I had a meeting early this morning, and the person I had that meeting with was like, I can't wait for our future. Was so bright sky excited about the Bengals' future that it made me go, okay, check yourself. Like, But as long as he can stay healthy, as long as he can stay unafraid, then you know, may, we're already looking to next season. Yeah, you got to you gotta fix the present if you want a future because if he can't get it up from the turf, you know, this season, then there is no future. Right, and how do you not protect your best asset? I mean, this that's, to me, he's the golden goose. Why wouldn't you spend any amount of money, any amount of time and energy to make sure that that that, that person who you are building your whole franchise around stays healthy and safe? You know, how do we fix this offensive line? They've got to block better. That's that's at the end of the day, it's it's like they've got to protect Joe Burrow better, and that's no secret whatsoever. All right, we'll talk a little AJ Green. He's healthy this year, he's playing, he's made some really good plays. He's made some impressive AJ AJ Green looking plays that you expect him to make. He's also looked maybe, I don't know, I don't know, a little bit off. And he doesn't look right to me. He doesn't look like the AJ Green. Yeah, he just looked like the AJ Green that I've come to love to watch. He just seems like he's he, he, uh, he stretched himself out there for that first ball, but it almost was like he was afraid to get hurt. And I don't think he is getting the love and respect that he deserves from the refs because he's getting manhandled. I mean, he's getting like, I get that you're going to cover him. He's the guy to cover, but awfully tight. You got, like, you know, critical third downs that, you know, I heard Joe Buck several times on the broadcast. He's like, yeah, A.J. Green out on this play. And it's like, what? Like, usually he's the guy that is always in. He's the go-to guy for, you know, everything. Like, I just remember how well he was playing two years ago when the Bengals started off winning a bunch of games and, you know, they ended up collapsing a couple years ago. But, like, that – 
pass that he caught in Atlanta to win the game, that was like peak A.J. Green. And then I remember he had the, the what was it, the three-touchdown game on Thursday Night Football to Tanya's point. That was like the last time that they really played well on Thursday mm-hmm. night is when he had that play uh, or when he had that night um, against Baltimore. And that A.J. Green does not look like the A.J. Green we've seen the first couple weeks. And as I was thinking, I don't know if it's maybe him just trying to work himself back into his playing rhythm, but he dropped a couple passes, one one touchdown pass he dropped. Um, it's, it's just something amiss there. Something's not all the way right. And maybe as he continues to stay healthy, fingers crossed, as he continues to stay healthy and work his way back into – you know, real game shape, that rhythm will come back and he'll start to look like the A.J. Green that we come to know. But even just as far as, like, his separation on DBs, it's it's still not as as great as it was that we've, you know, come to know him to be. So that's something. I'm worried about him. Yeah, there's something off there. And, you know, as I was saying, as Jake Ryle tweeted last night, when he catches a pass or when he makes a play, you kind of just hold your breath. And then when you he gets up, you know, on that first play that you mentioned, Tanya, where he stretched out, it ended up not being a catch. But he hurt himself on that play. Looks like yeah. he uh, got the wind knocked out of him. And when he got up wincing, I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, please be okay. And when he got back in the game, I was like, okay, okay, he's good. But, you know, there's there's a tentativeness there from him, and then there's a hesitation even in us as, you know, watchers, if you will, Like, what's going to happen with this guy? Is he going to be cool or is he, you know, is he going to get hurt again? I'm going to switch gears here. And at any level of football, I mean, we could be talking peewee, eight, nine-year-old football. What do they say? They say defense wins championships. And they say that generally in a one-game setting, the team that turns the ball over less is going to win the game a high percentage of times. And those are two things that the Bengals have struggled at. Last night, tackling was poor. Tackling was poor. Now, they had the one big goal line stand, but then you offset that with what we just talked about, and that's a turnover. And then you force the Bengals' defense to have two goal line stands in the course of, what, maybe one minute, and that's generally not going to happen ever again at any level of football. How do we clean up the defense, the tackling, but also the turnovers? Those have been two issues, and if you don't play good defense and if you turn the ball over more than the other team – That is a very, very hard formula to overcome. I'm going to leave that to you boys to answer because having never played a down in football, I can't even begin to understand how you're going to fix that. That's coaching to me. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Tanya. It's it's coaching. Um, I saw a lot of people calling for uh, the defensive coordinator lose head yesterday just because – some of these issues that we saw happen yesterday looked a lot like 2019. And if you remember week two of last year, they also got chopped up. Like San Francisco came in town and just beat the Bengals down. Like they had no answer for anything that they had to do. And for the Cleveland Browns to look as bad as they did last week, mind you, we said, it was against the Ravens, who are far and away a better team than they're, – they're the class of the division, I would say. But still, like, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, they were running all through these dudes. And with the defense looking how it did last week, several goal line stands, you know, playing tough on the receivers outside, really playing a good style of bend, don't break football to see them just fold like a a chair that they use in professional wrestling matches, that was just ridiculous to me. Like, I just saw it and I I tweeted out (laughs) a give yesterday, but like seeing these guys just whiff, whiff, whiff was disheartening. And also it was something that maybe I expected to, to see last week because, you know, there was, time where they didn't play anybody but themselves. I thought the defense looked better last week after not playing anyone than they did this week after having an opponent last week. Like, they had live football last week, and they looked worse 
this time than they did in week one. I don't understand that. And you can say short week all you want, but let's be really honest here. It was a short week for the Browns, too. Yeah. Exactly. So. That's not know. an excuse in the same. Because I was thinking that, too. I'm like, oh, short week. But then I'm looking at two teams that had short weeks. And, you know, they both had the game plan. I mean, they both had – the same amount of rest, so that's just – you're right. That doesn't can, – Can I just say we can always go to Reggie Wilson for a good, strong analogy, folding like a chair used in professional wrestling. I saw that on Twitter last night, and I was like, that's a Reggie Wilson analogy if I've ever heard it. What was it on TV that one night? You said the uh, the Reds are heating up like – what was it? Heating up like cold dinner on the stove or something like that? Yeah, you, you got to, you know, you just got to let the people understand where you're coming from. Everybody can get, the, you know, my pro wrestling fans out there, if one of those guys <laughs> got hit with a chair, hey, that thing was folding up. So, you know, people understand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope that the Bengals defense can uh, can rise a little bit from that analogy in the coming weeks. <laughs> and, and the good thing is we talked about a short week. The thing that always comes with a Thursday night game is – you know, yes, you have the short week, but it's followed by a long week. You get extra days to recover. You get extra days to prepare. You get to sit and literally watch your opponent play that, you know, on the on the coming Sunday. And that opponent this week is the Eagles. That's who the Bengals will play, not this week. And then it is the first away game. It's in Philadelphia. Uh, the Eagles, by the way, lost last week by 10 to the – to the. Uh, I almost tripped myself up there – to the Washington football team. The football team. team. Yeah, they lost last week to the football team. And then this Sunday, the Eagles are so playing Reggie Wilson's favorite team. And they are a one-point favorite against the Rams. So it's expected to be – that was kind of a little little uh, jab there at Reggie and, and at his St. Louis background there. But it's a uh, it's just it's expected to be a dogfight this weekend. So that maybe that plays in the Bengals' favor because you know that the, the Eagles are not looking at all you know, worried about the Bengals at all right now until they get through this this weekend's game against uh, against the Rams. But how much can – I mean, what, what do the Bengals need to be doing during this long week other than watching the Eagles and things and, – and other than Joe Burrow maybe wearing ice packs all over his body? Yes, please. Good Lord. I think, I think they need to go back to the drawing board. Like, this is enough time to – you would think – correct the mistakes that you had on defense. Like, I don't want you all to come out again and show us that type of performance on defense after having this long of a time. Like, it would be almost an embarrassment if they did that. Like, for two straight weeks, having that type of defensive performance, like, were guys just so out of place? Like, how do you look solid in one week and then the next week just look so out of sorts? Like, you can't stop anything. And I think that's what it's not that the Browns are that much better than the Chargers either. Let's be really exactly. Honest. And you know, Carson Wentz, he is a dynamic quarterback. They have a pretty dynamic offense. You know, they're only a couple years removed from a Super Bowl. Like this team is dangerous. Also, they have a kicker that, you know, they drafted, you know, Jake Elliott and um, he doesn't have any type of calf problem. I was going to say, how are his calves doing this year? <laughs> yeah, he, he looks good. I, I still don't understand how you draft a guy and then let him go in preseason, but whatever. That's that's another story. But I think what they'll we'll do another do, podcast on that later on in the week or something. Exactly. But what they also have to do, I think, is for, for the second straight year, they are struggling to get this run game going. And I think that is a problem. You just signed Mixon to this long term extension. And, you know, you say enough about the line not protecting Joe Burrow. They're not opening up any lanes for Joe Mixon either. Uh, Second straight, I got the stats here, 16 carries for 46 yards, 2.9 average. Like, And, you know, if you take the number six, you take his number of carries 16 and switch the two numbers, you get 61, and that's part of the problem, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And the same same thing happened last year. You know, at first, it was crazy that Joe got over a thousand yards last year because I he, I remember he had a, a rushing performance. It was like six carries for three yards or something in a game. It was crazy. There like, was, um, they got to get him going. I was thinking the same thing we started talking about Mixon. And I remembered last year that he started out so poorly that we were like, well, this is just what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
the Bengals got better through the season last year as, as one in 15 goes or whatever they ended up. I don't even want to remember what that record was last year, but they, they ended up doing so much better. They lost a lot of games by like a touchdown or, you know, something within nine points, something like that. I'm not a statistics person at all, but I remember thinking how in the world is Mixon going to have a good season? And he ended up doing well. What that tells me is that the team got better. So I'm hoping it's the same deal, is that that, that that line can learn how to open up some lanes and let him get through traffic and go. And it, it has to happen that way, right? It has to. And I appreciate that they did sign this guy and they have put all their faith behind him and they've given him big dollars and said, all right, you're our guy, go. But, you know, again, you you got to give him the space to do it. And back to your question about what did the defense do? I, if I am the head coach of that team, I think that I have, you know, I would like to see this head coach who seems to be an awfully nice guy, get a little pissed. And maybe he does behind closed doors, but to his, to his um, coordinator and just like, how can you allow this to happen? That was an embarrassment on national television last night. And by the way, since Caleb, I know you grew up around here, but you've been gone for a while. We don't do well on nighttime national games. <laughs> so I always cringe when I know that the Bengals are going to play on a Thursday night or a Sunday night. Um, so they always get humiliated. And that was another a moment when you kept hearing Chubb, Chubb. I could not stand hearing his name called one more time. Like this is insane it was bad that's what you do when you play from ahead though you just do try to demoralize the defense the best you can with the ground game you run that clock and that's what the browns did for the most part they maybe threw the ball a few times when they should have been running the ball but for the most part you know the browns did what they needed to do on the ground well then well played by the browns because they they certainly took away all manhood from <laughs> who someone said that that was that was like a emasculating run or something or series and it was true it was like this is just hard to watch towards the end of the game gratefully I had to go in and do my real job so I couldn't watch some of that and um you're watching the game through tweets I was well through you I go Kayla what's happening and so <laughs> that's actually that's a very true story it's pretty accurate too that was a pretty accurate the like, way the screaming happened yeah yeah well guys you know the, again, the Bengals did cover the spread, so I guess we can we can hang our hat on that for this week. But the Bengals are 0-2 with a matchup coming up against the Eagles. Again, not Jeez. this weekend, but next weekend. That is a it's a long week upcoming for the Bengals. You got to imagine that's a good thing. Generally, with a you know with a long week coming up, you use the first three days to rest. You use the first three days to watch film um, and and recoup from really two games in the course of five days or so. And then you hit it hard, and that whole time, you you realistically are preparing for your next opponent, which is Philadelphia. As Reggie mentioned, that's going to be no walk in the park. It's the first away game. We'll see how that goes. Looking forward to that, guys. We will do another Flying Pigskin podcast after week three and hopefully have a win to talk about. Reggie, Tanya, thank you guys so much for joining me. As always, and all the viewers, thank you all for joining us this week on the Flying Pigskin Podcast. We'll see you next week. And as always, good day.